you got your music placed in a Taco Bell commercial for 30 seconds, and you got four grand. Yep. Jesus Christ. Yep. All right, guys, what's up? So this week, I have a full interview with a homie XJ Will. This is somebody who's been doing sync licensing for their full-time job for quite some time now, and I wanted to open you guys up to some new ways to make money with your music production. As always, the whole interview can be accessed within our course, The Constant Conversion Strategy. And I also wanna let you know that yesterday, I added nine new videos to the course about building your own custom WordPress website to be your beat store. This is something that has been highly requested over the past few months, and it looks like it's already doing a killer job with helping you guys learn how to do it. And I know I repeat this every week, but I truly believe that our course is going to give you the best chance to start selling your beats online or sell more beats online. And the reason why I say this is because the results that we're constantly getting producers within our course. And if you want to learn more about the course, the information can be found within the free masterclass linked below. Enjoy the full interview. Peace out. All right, what's good, everybody? Today, I am here with XJ Will. I believe 60,000 on TikTok, like 57. 7k we getting close close enough so we're gonna say we're he makes a living off sync licensing i don't know what were you gonna say i didn't mean to cut you off we're just no we're just you're, you're like good this. i was i was just saying uh i'm jealous because my wife she's a tiktoker too and she's got like she's got like twice as much as i do it's really? ridiculous yeah man she does hair influencing so it's like That's crazy. it's like there's a bigger niche for that and yeah. like it just makes me mad because i told i taught her how to do it and now she's like huge <laughs> No, she's better than you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. Right. Awesome. So we are going to dive into Josh's background. Like I said, he makes a living with sync licensing. I think sync licensing is going to be like stupidly popular in the next year or so. I don't know why it's not blowing up yet because you're working with but like bigger brands that have tens of thousands of dollars to throw to you instead of rappers who can pay a few hundred for a beat. So uh, we're gonna talk about that. Also, like I said, he has a lot of followers on TikTok. So the guy must know something about content creation. You guys know I love content creation. So we're gonna pick his brain apart on that. But Josh, if you wanna give maybe like a formal introduction to who you are, how you found yourself in sync licensing, your background in music, go for it, man. Okay. Um, I am, okay, well, first of all, the name is Josh Williams. It's XJ Will on social media and the x is silent Some, that's something that everybody asks all the time um i grew up a trumpet player actually i started playing trumpet at like the age of 11. i still play today but um i remember after i graduated from a um, university of kansas city missouri um that degree back there is worth literally toilet paper maybe less uh post pandemic just because like no one ever asked me for it and like they teach us how to play they don't teach us how to eat you know oh. what i mean and so because of that like i remember vividly i was going to me and some friends were going to a colleague's um uh concert it was actually one of the adjunct faculty members at the uh college and so we're going through we're supporting and stuff and we're kind of hanging out and during the intermission i look at the envelope or pamphlet or whatever checking out like who's all in the band all that kind of information mm -hmm. and i find out that this concert's a benefit concert because he couldn't pay his health insurance and so i was like oh no this is my future if i can't figure out how to make to make a living and i was like i don't want to like tour when i'm like 45 50 and like i got a family at home like it just didn't I could just see it and I was just like, nah, man, I got to figure something else out. And so like, um, after a couple months of research, I was like, how is everybody actually making a living still on music, even though they're not touring? Mm -hmm. And the, the biggest answer is just one word publishing. If you own your publishing, your music can be licensed and used over and over and over again. Yeah. And so I had a band at the time that we were playing, uh, we were playing around town and doing like Midwest tours and stuff um, that I managed and played in. And I was like, yo, from now on, we're not just playing Kanye covers or anything like that. We're going to play our own music. And I got a little pushback for it at first. But when we got our royalties checks from playing our own music, so we got paid at the gig and then got paid again, like later in the year from our uh, PROs because we were performing our music publicly. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, you get a you get a um, royalty for it. So like, even if we don't get on the radio, if we playing every night, like in larger venues, like we get paid anyway. Mm -hmm. So um, from there, when I got married, uh, my wife was, I, I just realized that even like playing clubs all night, like it's it's bad for the family. Yeah. So like, 
eventually my, my wife's like why don't you just make music music from home and at first i had pushback because i was like i don't want to write jingles for like companies and stuff that doesn't make any sense corny i'm trying to be an artist and like i didn't realize that like that was essentially what i was doing the whole time because as a jazz musician like we come up with melodies we make up stuff all the time off the fly based off of the vibe of the room uh, uh conversation what we're having with the other instruments on stage and stuff so like i was literally writing music to picture in real time all the time and i just Crazy. didn't have a computer in front of me mm -hmm. so um from there um I, just, I got into it at first it was stock music and i couldn't find a budget for it and then i started finding out finding out about how uh brands have these bigger budgets when they're um broadcasting uh pictures and and stuff and they need music behind it so uh from there i got into uh, uh researching music libraries sync agents and stuff like that and it took me like a year to really get something placed because i had to i had to put my reps in man like i didn't realize what you needed to do in order to have music that's built better for tv commercials and movies and stuff like that aside from just like making tracks for an artist mm -hmm. like it's a completely different um structure so like after that my i got my first placement at taco bell and from there i was like oh i see the formula now and then from there like it kind of had a snowball effect all right man so i'm gonna I'm cut deep real quick let's let's see how much we can test this how much was the taco bell placement if you're comfortable sharing let me actually i got the i, oh, I saved the email because like i was <laughs> that was a big moment in your career yeah man i was just like yo this is cool like we <laughs> tr crunch or whatever <laughs> Um, they just send you back a gift card. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> the crazy Thanks. thing is that, like, like I was saying, it took me a year in that that in that in that span when I got finally signed into a library. Um, I pumped them full of tracks because mm -hmm. I was trying to. I figured like, if there's a one percent chance that I could catch lightning in a bottle when someone randomly goes through the library's uh, catalog and they find me, like, that's great. Yeah. The only way to do that though was to make a bunch and. Uh, I had like 200 songs in before I actually nailed yeah. one. Um, let me see here. Here it is. It was for four thousand dollars, and it was wow. thirty seconds. Okay, <laughs> so you got your music placed in a Taco Bell commercial for thirty seconds, and you got four grand. Yep. Jesus Christ. Yep. And um, the, I, again, like I was saying, it was only for. Let's see. I'm looking at the the uh, the description here it was only for like six weeks so like after that i owned it again and i could shop it out to another company if they wanted to use it that is insane man all right now i have a lot of questions now <laughs> now i got so many questions to go off of so i think oh, i think well first i guess we'll do a, a general overview of what sync is because i know some people might not know what sync is this definitely is a new world for some people i mean you mentioned it you were playing live and you're kind of doing it already, essentially. But can you explain what sync is and what you do on your day-to-day -day basis, essentially? Okay. So sync licensing basically is anything that uh, involves a moving picture. If you synchronize your music behind that picture, it's a it's a it's a license. It's you need um, companies, film companies, um, brands. They need a license so that they have permission to use your your art or your um, your music behind their um their picture the the biggest thing that are the easiest way to illustrate is that we all need a license to drive right and that mm -hmm. license shows that we understand the rules the privileges the responsibilities we have operating a motor vehicle they need the same kind of license to say that they understand copyright law and that they they can only use it for this amount of time during this term in this context etc cetera, etc cetera. awesome i love that it's a super easy analogy okay cool so now getting into sync licensing now we're dealing i think you know with, with selling beats and right you're working with artists who are can be a lot more not taco bell level essentially same with budget same with copyright policies and whatnot so i think usually the biggest thing when people get into sync is more so sampling collabing with other producers um i will well, sampling is pretty much right out the door anyway but with websites like Splice. I mean, are you doing all original music? Are you collabing with other people? Are you going to websites like Splice or is it just all original music just to make sure that there's no way that you get screwed out of money? Um, It's always safe to not use samples, but 
if you're if you're adept enough as a producer to be able to flip something so it's unrecognizable like sometimes i'll take a pad and turn it into a pluck so there's no way you can really catch it as like it being the same sample mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying like th then it's okay um but i do highly recommend that you at least before you submit something to a, a label i mean not a label a um a sync agent or a library that you make sure you at least shazam it to make sure that it's not technically published that's mm -hmm. always like the last rule of thumb for me um but as as mentioned before like these companies are paying thousands upon thousands of dollars for uh, for use of your music the last thing they want to do is know that you paid 895 to just throw a couple of loops together mm -hmm. and have ta-da we have a track like my, <laughs> my 12 year old niece can do that you see what i'm saying so uh -huh. like in order to like make sure that your music sounds expensive like you have to make sure that you're putting in the work for it and um i mean it's it's as we can talk about even more in depth like it, it just it makes everything um more business stable for for everybody yeah i think i, I do want to jump to that because i think that's the biggest thing that i've learned with looking at more sync licensing interviews i even made the joke you know you came on here like five minutes early like no other producer would ever do that in my life i swear um, so, I, you know, like you're submitting emails, you might be doing cold outreach to music supervisors, and I guess we can go over that term too later on, but you're really, you're dealing with a lot of money and a lot more time. People, like people need to have their time together. So can you explain like how that, that differs in this industry and how important it is to be like, to have your shit together? Yeah, I think um, the biggest thing, especially for producers, is you can't be married to your music because we're making utility music. And I talk about this in the class, like, because we're uh, normally in the in Hollywood and in the film industry, 10% of the budget gets put towards music. Like we're the last thing in the line mm -hmm. in order to cre create a production. So because of that, like, if they need something changed, that's a good thing. That means that they're, there's only like one or two tweaks that they need in order to put this in the film and you get the placement. Um, if not, like you can't, be too personal about like hey we need something changed well this is my art like no one cares you know what i'm saying like <laughs> you'd be surprised how many pieces of music you hear a day on commercials and stuff that people don't even pay attention to like one of the biggest questions i get on my uh channel is like what kind of music should i make you, you i mean you have commercials every everywhere in your face like you mm -hmm. can kind of if you just sit back and listen you can kind of figure out what uh what's being used at the moment mm -hmm. okay so Let's talk about, so my one question here I had is most of us are familiar, since it's all cell beats guys, is where my audience is, is it's usually like, okay, I have a beat of, I have a pack of beats or I upload my beats online and rappers find them, which probably doesn't correlate to sync licensing, but still maybe I have a pack of beats, I give it to rappers. In sync licensing, how do I take that same pack of beats and get it going somewhere in the direction where it could get me a placement? Okay. so. Um, the first thing I would make sure you do is make sure you have all your PRO stuff kind of set up because that's how you get your royalties. Mm -hmm. uh, your back end, you, you'll normally get paid on the front end first, and then um, after it airs and stuff like that, you'll get your BMI stuff or your ASCAP, what have you. Um, but I normally would actually recommend um, if you've already released those tracks out into the ether, the internet or whatever, mm -hmm. like just make more. Cause like, unfortunately, if someone, that maybe bought a non-exclusive license so they own technically half of the mechanical royalties of that track like if they if they release it or publish it and you uh library wants to pick it up or a brand is like hey we want to use this it becomes really really hairy because now you have multiple owners on that track you see what i'm saying so mm -hmm. it's, i always recommend just make more and it, it, again it gets your reps up and that's what you kind of need um after you build it for sync um, which takes a little bit of different tweaking uh, compared to um, uh, an artist track. Mm -hmm. Normally what you do is you would um, you would either Google um, different music libraries, uh, sync agents, and from there, normally they would have the relationships because a music supervisor is who you actually want to get in contact with. But most of us don't know them, right? They're the people that make the decisions between like, okay, I need to use this song here. So in order to... Um, to get to them, sometimes what you can do is you can either go on LinkedIn and find them and just say, hey, you want to use my tracks? But normally it doesn't work because they don't know you from Joe Schmo off the street. And yeah. if you don't have cleared samples, like that can be a legal problem. So the best thing to do, I, I advise for most um, music producers is to start with libraries first. 
because the libraries are this nice safe pool where uh, music uh, supervisors can go and go through the catalog and not have to worry about anything. Everything's cleared, the library's checked up on everything and they have all the PRO information, all that kind of stuff, like ready to go. So what I would do um, is actually Google different libraries, make sure they're vetted, they're making placements uh, that, that are recent. Um, and then going through their library maybe and seeing what they're lacking in their catalog and then saying, hey, I make stuff like this. I think it would be um, super helpful for you. Um, normally they have a submission process near the uh, bottom of their websites. And from there, that's how you basically start the process. Because after that, after you get in and you sign a publishing deal with them, um, now you have to become a machine and start filling up with music. Mm -hmm. So Awesome. So I yeah. love what you said there and actually look at their library they have and realize what they're missing. Because I think too, with, with also, I can't imagine how many freaking submissions these libraries get. And also, I guess this is another, sub, another subject to talk about. I, for one video I made on the Heat channel, I pretended to be a rapper where I gave out my email on Twitter. I said, send yeah. beats. And people were just sending me MP3 files. No words at all. So like without, I know you have a course about sync licensing. I don't want to ruin your whole livelihood by giving out the email sauce. <laughs> Man, it's all good. I, I think that, um, so like the email stuff normally doesn't, for most libraries, they, you don't have to. Okay. Like they normally have like a submission feed where they, um, you could just describe your music and send it through their website. Okay. But if you want to attack the, uh, the other side, which is kind of going around the, uh, music libraries and, and talk directly to the, uh, supervisors, mm -hmm. that's where the emails kind of come in. And, um, you never ever send an MP3. Please don't, because these people get 300 emails a week, minimum. And the last thing they need is your your MP3s clogging up their server. <laughs> so like, make sure you have some type, I recommend using a, um, even a private link like a Dropbox, or I like to use Disco, because that's something that a lot of the um, music supervisors use. You know how like, sometimes you'll talk to a producer and you ask what DAW they use, and mm. then if you guys use the same one, it's like, oh, we got a connection, like we can talk about the same stuff, I understand your language. It's the same way with that, with disco, basically. Ooh, okay, see, I've heard this, actually, some guy we interviewed before, Excalibur, he said he uses disco oh, as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now, awesome. I'm putting the pieces together. Okay, so disco is what you gotta be on. Yeah, okay. it's like 10 bucks a month, but like, that easily pays for itself and it's a tax write-off. So like, it's not really that even Bro, that big of a deal. That's not a big business thing I think we could talk. I mean, I mean you could talk for hours and hours. Oh, yeah, yeah. Recently, I've got into doing more freelance stuff with every all the shit I'm doing, and I realized like, yo, like everything I do is a write-off. And it was just like, that's, I think that's like the two different, this is a, a really side thing right now, but like that's when you know you transition as a producer. It's like, I'm not pirating plugins. I'm buying them for tax write-off purposes. Exactly. You're gonna get that money back. <laughs> <laughs> so, so like either the either the government's getting it or you're reinvesting back in yourself yeah and that's a it's a nice little paradigm shift for producers there but so you yeah, mentioned up as a business instead of yeah, just an individual exactly you mentioned registering with a pro so for usa that's ascap bmi i know depending what country you live there's different ones mm -hmm. so do you register every song that you send out or is it just you send you know your tracks to the library they're like hey what's your info and you just give them your number so you don't um, question there maybe well it's it's just it depends on your circumstance because sometimes a library will do that for you okay and um so like nine times out of ten i don't have to do it myself at all because like the libraries that i work with they if it gets placed then they'll go ahead and register and do all that kind of stuff before they hand it over to the brand mm -hmm. you see what i'm saying so like yeah. but if you're pitching yourself then yeah i would recommend that you make sure that you uh you at least register everything Awesome. Awesome. Good question. Now, I know you mentioned that there there's two types of ways to get paid from sync. That's upfront and back end, correct? Right. Mm -hmm. So the upfront fee is just if you were working with Taco Bell again, they'd be like, hey, we'll pay you this much upfront. And then back end royalties, how much it generates from being on TV, correct? Exactly. So the upfront is kind of like the mechanical side, like they're, they're just using the permission for you for them to use your song. Mm -hmm. And the uh, the performance royalties is what you get on the back end. And unfortunately, we don't really understand how well there's sometimes we do it depend like Excalibur, he specializes more in the TV show side, mm -hmm. I think. Sure. Yeah. And like, 
there's things called like in context versus uh, out of context use. So like if, uh, for instance, a, uh, a song is actually being featured, like someone's performing your song, or maybe um, okay. like there's a montage going on and no one's talking over it, like that's in context. It, they're, they're actually using your lyrics to tell a story, mm -hmm. if there are any lyrics. But if it's out of context, like it's just like club music in the background that you hear like all muffled and stuff like that, like that's out of context. And normally that that in context will pay more than the than the the other. Okay. So. Okay. Major gems. Uh, Major gems yeah. there.